Good evening. I have been waiting almost two years to say these words. Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you for joining us this, this evening, the fourth night of Hanukkah. It's so good to be back in this space. While we have a split audience tonight, many of you are here in person and online, we will continue to offer our, uh, our online programming for those of, of you who do not come back, but we would love to see you here when the time comes. Before I introduce our special guests this evening, I just want to say thank you to all of you who have stuck by us, the, the LBJ Library and the LBJ Foundation during a very, very challenging times. I, I, I've said this before and I mean it sincerely, this is the best audience in the world. True. Uh, from my perspective. There you go. You guys were supposed to wait till I introduced you. This is not going well at all. Uh, this is, wow, okay. Uh, so uh, we, we appreciate your, your support. We appreciate the support of the Moody Foundation, one of our longtime supporters of the LBJ, the Friends of the LBJ Library. We will in turn try to do the very best in giving you the best in public programming. To that end, next month we'll resume our in-person programming on January 19th with an evening with author Julia Swag, whose book Lady Bird Johnson Hiding in Plain Sight has become a sensation. She uh, published the book and then uh, created the podcast In Plain Sight Lady Bird Johnson with ABC News, which was also a, a smash success. Uh, we will, in addition to that program, we will feature LBJ Library Director Mark Lawrence, I think Mark is here somewhere, who will be doing a tw six part series on the American presidency and so there will be more details about that forthcoming. Finally, the store at the LBJ Library will be selling the official 2021 White House Christmas ornament. <laughs> which I will be talking to our guest, Stuart McLaurin, about shortly. Uh, now, bear in mind that they sold it before the program, they will sell it after the program, and those of you online can get it at lbjstore.com. This is tax-free day, so you get an additional 10% discount because of that. So get your 2021 White House ornament featuring President Lyndon Baines Johnson. This is our turn in the barrel for the White House Christmas is a big deal for us. Now, tonight, it is my pleasure to welcome Stuart McLaurin, the president of the White House Historical Association, an organization he has grown tremendously since he took on the role in 2014. He has also served in leadership roles for the American Red Cross, Georgetown University, and the Reagan Presidential Library Foundation. And we all know Lucy Baines Johnson and our own Lucy not only as the younger daughter of President and Mrs. Johnson, but for her extraordinary philanthropy and her tireless efforts to, around voting rights, an issue in, uh, endemic to the legacy of her father, the 36th president. And finally, her family knows her for her singular devotion as a, uh, a wife, a mother, and a grandmother. So uh, join me once again, please, in welcoming Stuart McLaurin and Lucy Banks Johnson. Ornament. Well, clearly I'm a little rusty. I've, I've, <laughs> I've atrophied during, during COVID, but I'll, I'll try to get my sea legs back tonight. Welcome again, everybody. And welcome to you two. We're delighted to have you here. Stuart, I'm going to start with you. Um, the, you and Lucy were just back in New York City with a very big celebration around the 60th anniversary of the White House Historical Association that included Dr. Jill Biden, our First right. Lady. So how did the White House Historical Association begin 60 years ago? Well, I'll be happy to answer that, but first of all, I want to thank you for the invitation to be here at the wonderful LBJ Library and to be with Presidential Royalty here, Lucy, to, to <laughs> join the stage. I don't feel a very, don't feel worthy to share the stage with a, a presidential <laughs> family member and to Mark, 
Uh, really appreciate your friendship that you've been to us at the association, our work together on the Presidential Site Summit and many other things, and uh, look forward to continuing the work that we do together as the library and the association. But as you mentioned, we are celebrating our 60th anniversary of the White House Historical Association. And in a nutshell, we were founded in 1961 by then First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy. And remember, she's 31 years old when her husband becomes president. She's First Lady for less than three years. But what she put in place, and then the mantle that was taken up by Mrs. Johnson, that process and that procedures, those procedures for historic preservation at the White House, those things are still in place today. What a remarkable legacy for Mrs. Kennedy, Mrs. Johnson, and those who have followed to take care of that house on behalf of the American people. Because as we were talking about earlier, it belongs to the American people, not to any one particular president. We're a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. Our role is exactly the same, regardless who the president and first lady may be. We've had the privilege of working with 12 of those over the years. And we do that on behalf of the American people. We privately fund the acquisition of items into the collection of the White House, the maintaining of that collection. So when you walk on the state floor, the ground floor, everything you see, decorative arts, fine arts, furnishings, furniture, rugs, draperies, everything in some way was funded or touched or cared for or acquired by the White House Historical Association for the American people. And I don't think people fully realize that. Mm. It's a wonderful public-private partnership. And then the last part of our mission, in addition to that, is an education mission. And this is where we partner so well with the presidential libraries across the country to teach and tell the stories of the White House and its history dating back to the cornerstone in 1792. And we do that a variety of ways. One of those are these wonderful ornaments, but also publications, public programming, teacher institutes, and a variety of things. So it's a real pleasure to do this on your behalf. We've been doing it for 60 years, and I hope we're doing it for 60 more or longer. So Stuart, Jacqueline Kennedy really captured the imagination of the American people around the White House as she was establishing the White House Historical Association. She did so in part in a, in a television tour. Uh, the, the, most of the American people had never seen the White House before, but she gave an enormously popular interview on television. Talk about that and how that ignited public interest in the White House. Well, television was a fairly new medium at the time, and Truman had done a television interview, but no one had really taken the American people behind the scenes into the various rooms of the White House, particularly in a way that showcased all of the things that she had done in a pretty short order. So Charles Collingwood of CBS News and this large television camera at the time trundled through these beautiful rooms of the state floor, and she told the story behind each of the things that had been acquired. The anniversary of that occasion is coming up on Valentine's mm. Day of uh, 2022. And it was a wonderful Valentine that she gave to the American people of revealing this story. And not only was it aired by CBS, but something that would be remarkable to us today it was aired by ABC, NBC, and CBS. Mm. So it was as if the entire nation saw Mrs. Kennedy share the people's house with the American people. It was very special. Lucy, your first Christmas in the White House was in 1963. We had lost President Kennedy on November 22nd, just before Thanksgiving. And you and your family moved into the White House on December 7th. What was that holiday season like? What do you remember about that holiday season? Well, starting on November 22nd, 1963, the entire house was draped in black cloth of mourning. And the American people felt draped in that suffocating grief of black. And all of a sudden, on, no, on December 22nd, 1963, it all came off. And not only did it come off, but Christmas began. And I think I and, and millions of other Americans had been so devastated by this loss of this vital and attractive and intelligentic hmm. president and first lady and little children that we felt like the agony was going to be endless. And the emotion and the pain that we'd felt 
on November 22nd was going to last forever. Mm. So when those black drapes came off and Christmas came, it was a sense of tomorrow is happening. There's hope. There's beauty. There's love still left in the world. They may have killed our president, but they cannot kill our people. Right. And the American spirit was rekindled again. My mother writes about uh, how wonderful it was to witness that in her White House diary. And as I prepared for tonight, uh, I went back and read over the Christmases. You know, there's nothing like having your mother help you with your homework. <laughs> and, 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 and my mother has been de dead since 2007, and she continues to help me with my homework <laughs> because I have that marvelous reference of her White House diary to, to go back to. And so I feel the, the sense of, of um, relief. Mm that my mother felt when I read her memories of that time. Mm -hmm. But my mother, who was never a self-promoter, never mentioned that that day that the White House black veil of mourning was taken away mm -hmm. was also her birthday. Mm -hmm. So you ask me about that, it, it was as if uh, we had been all caged in pain mm. for one month. And all of a sudden, not only was that gone, but Christmas was here, the most celebratory, exciting, hope-filled time of the year. The time of year where we all look out at people we love and say, I want to tell you so. Mm. I want to tell you I love you. And I think Americans who had been feeling such sadness for so long felt an, an extra appreciation mm. of their fellow countrymen and their fellow human beings in ways that maybe uh, lots of us have forgotten until we went through the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, when we first got to see our mothers and fathers and grandparents and, and aunts and uncles and children, and we realized that the pandemic wasn't going to destroy us if we would just try to do what we had to in order to stay safe and well. Mm. We, too, could do our part. And I think that's what Americans felt uh, after the assassination. We, too, must do our part, our part of mourning, mm. but our part of preparing mm. for the future. And that was the day that I think, in many ways, um, the Johnson administration really began. So you were 16 years old, Lucy, when you moved into the White House, young. Um, and you're suddenly thrust into this role as first daughter. Did you feel like your Christmas was your own, or did you feel like it sort of belonged to the nation in a way? No, of course, uh, Christmas belonged to the nation. Uh, my mother has a wonderful uh, a uh, quote in her White House diary that I won't pretend to recall because memory is a poor servant for me at this age. But I, I think I can para paraphrase its spirit. And she said, I think in the Christmas of uh, 1967, you know, every day in the White House is a gift, mm. but never more so than at Christmas. Mm. And I think that uh, that is very much the way that uh, all Americans are, are feeling today, that uh, every gift, every day that our country survives, every day that our uh, first family appreciates and treasures the privilege of being there is a gift, mm. but especially so mm. in the holidays. Stuart, since taking over as president in, uh, of the White House Historical Association in 2014, you've worked with, with three first families and three first ladies. You've worked with Michelle Obama, Melania Trump, and now Jill Biden. Mm -hmm. So when they're thinking about the White House at Christmas, how do they formulate their plans? What, what goes through their minds, and how do they come to fruition, those plans? Well, you've just referenced three very different first ladies in many, many ways. Uh, but we work within the same and, and effectively in, in whatever interests they may have. And 
Each of those have taken on, a, uh, Mrs. Obama, Mrs. Trump, and now Ms. Dr. Biden, taken on different interests with the House. And they all have their own visions, their own ideas. And planning for the Christmas decorations takes months to, to plan. So a first lady will talk with her staff about a concept or a theme. Uh, the theme for this year is gifts from the heart. And so as you go through the state floor, each room takes on a different gift. So there's the gift of family, the gift of service, the gift of friendship, the gift of learning, the gift of faith and community. And the decorations uh, bring those themes to life. And so the staff will work with the first lady and every decoration that has ever been used since the Kennedy years is saved in a warehouse, and things are often repurposed. They'll look very different. Sometimes they'll bring in new things. Oftentimes they'll bring in new things, but then they stay in the collection and can be repurposed in future presidencies. Probably the one thing that has become the most iconic piece of each presidential decorations is the gingerbread house, mm. and that really began in the Nixon presidency. That was the first to do the gingerbread house, and now it's this iconic building, literally, in the East Room, the current gingerbread house uh, took uh, 55 sheets of baked gingerbread, um, 120 pounds of this white sugar that almost um, uh, is like a shellac or a stucco and tartans on the house, 35 pounds of chocolate and 25 pounds of royal frosting. And it's quite an amazing beast in the East Room. Uh, but they, this one is a tribute to first responders and care workers during the a COVID pandemic. So each one has a different emphasis, a different interest, a wonderful staff. They're all creative. They all interpret the house uh, and make it special for those who have the privilege of going through. Unfortunately, during COVID, that has not been as much as we would like, and we're a big advocate for accessibility into the house. So just yesterday, I was over there, and they were filming um, uh, ballet dancers in the East Room and in the State Dining Room that they want to feature to show through social media and through a PBS spe or a HGTV special that's coming out uh, on decorations at the White House to try to show these decorations as much as possible. And we at the association have an app on our website. You can uh, go to our website and get the information to download this app. It will take you through the rooms of the White House as they're decorated uh, for Christmas. But each presidency is different. They all have a different theme. The theme started with Mrs. Kennedy, actually. I will point out just one other thing that's extremely precious in the decorations. And it's, to my knowledge, the only thing that is consistent every single year. And that's the Neapolitan crash mm. that's in the East Room that was acquired in 1967 um, by Mrs. Johnson. And as you walk down that beautiful red carpeted cross hall and enter the East Room, there it is right in front of you, and it's virtually floor to ceiling. It's spectacular. But it has been in that, in the, among the Christmas decorations every year since 1967. And if you read my mother's White House diary, you will uh, listen to her absolute ecstasy mm -hmm. about having made that acquisition and about how the wonderful philanthropist who had acquired it over the years was really down on her hands and knees putting it together uh, like families across the nation do uh, for their families, their favorite creches. But this woman was doing it for her country. In, our, in, in the nation's house for the American people. And that was what was so beautiful to me. After, if you read my mother's diary, one of her great concerns in the very beginning uh, of, of my father's administration is all those extraordinary philanthropists who mm -hmm. answered Mrs. Kennedy's mm -hmm. call and became a part of the White House Historical Association. Mother was desperately worried that they might all want to leave. They might mm -hmm. want to, to flee because the lady who had brought them to the party was no longer <laughs> there, and, and they didn't necessarily relate to us and ours. And Mother wanted to let them know how much she valued them, how much she appreciated them, how much she needed them, and how much this was not about her, mm, but it was right. about the American people. That's and right. it was about our need, because when we were formed as a nation, we were all so 
desperately scared of an imperial presidency that we literally, uh, the Congress held a very tight noose to, uh, to the budget that was allotted for the White House. So mm -hmm. presidents would bring their own furnishings mm -hmm. and they would take their own furnishings mm -hmm. home. And Mrs. Kennedy wanted to see if she could get people who could afford to maybe help purchase some of these furnishings to bring them back to the White House where they had sort of started That's off right. and enrich our, our nation's home. And she did so very successfully. So I, I remembered my mother's uh, excitement when she realized that many of these people were going to stay and and uh, live on in their association with the White House long after Lyndon Johnson came and went. Uh, but one other story that you may not know, that uh, a certain Lyndon Johnson great. was a very sentimental man. And he felt very badly that my mother had this painful birthday of December 22nd, <laughs> when all her life she was given a birthday present saying, happy birthday, Merry Christmas. <laughs> and, and the two were not separated. And anybody in the audience who has a child who has a, a holiday birthday is nodding, I can see you, because they felt had those same sentiments. Uh, and so on their last uh, Christmas mm. in the White House, my father wrote a very beautiful card mm. to my mother saying, happy birthday, Merry Christmas, but I am going to purchase the Christmas tree ornaments oh. that have been placed in the White House and uh, under our tenure and bring them home to you. That's very to special. Have I did not know at, that. To have at the LBJ Ranch. And so your Christmas tree ornaments mm. uh, became my uh, father's, one of my father's last gifts mm. to my mother. Mm. Stuart, I, a year ago, the Trumps were in the White House celebrating their last Christmas um, as uh, in, in the... In well, they the, probably weren't celebrating their last Christmas. Well, well that's sure. part of my question. That's, that's exactly right. But, but extraordinarily unusual mm -hmm. circumstances. There was no transition mm -hmm. to speak of between the Trump and Biden White mm -hmm. Houses. Uh, we've never had that in our history. You've sure. never had uh, a president refuse to observe one of the hallmarks of democracy, which is the peaceful transition mm -hmm. of, of, of power. How did that complicate things for you and your staff at the White House Historical Association? You would think it would, but it really did not. We work very closely with a core group of people, typically the First Lady's Chief of Staff, the Social Secretary, the Chief Usher of the White House, which is like the General Manager of the Residence, which is a career position, the Curator, which is the person who actually cares for all the art and objects, that is a career position, and everyone even the political staff working for the First Lady that we worked with mm. conducted themselves very professionally. There was, even though there was not interaction going on between the outgoing White House staff and the incoming White House staff, we were dealing simultaneously during the transition with both. Mm. So we were briefing the new staff, we were providing materials to them about what to expect, what projects we had been working on, what was underway, what they would be continuing, and what we had done in the past and it was seamless for us. And so although you saw uh, in news reports that there was this tension and this division, and certainly there was, in our work and in the work of the career people at the White House, which there are a number of those, you know, Lucy, you'll know the wonderful butlers and maids and housekeepers and chefs and florists and those who and are the- And they're all con artists, every one <laughs> oh, of them. Oh no. <laughs> every one of them, they make each presidential family feel they yes. love them true. best. True. And, true. and and that that it, that is a marvelous gift to first families. And they are true public to, servants. To feel loved and supported and understood when sometimes you feel the world doesn't understand you. The White House staff always does. <laughs> right. And, and uh, their gift to their country is um, so selfless right. and so dignified. And I, true. if I had to give a definition of what is a professional, mm -hmm. I would say the attitude and the respect and the dependability and the achievements of the White House permanent staff mm -hmm. are examples mm -hmm. for a us all. Absolutely, I completely agree, absolutely. 
Lucy, I, I want to ask about another Christmas you spent in the White House, 1967, when your sister got married during the holiday season. And, and here's what your mother said about her wedding. How could one describe the bride? With a mother's license, queenly, radiant, smiling, and stunningly beautiful. The whole setting was in a, the grand manner. I have never seen a lovelier ceremony. So what do you remember about that Christmas, your sister getting married, and I think your father took a four and a half day trip around the world, if memory serves. Well, the facts are that um, Christmas is not just a day. It's really a season. So we spent technically two Christmas days in the White House, but we spent uh, five uh, Christmas seasons there. And uh, 1967, I, I will never forget being awakened at 4 o'clock in the morning to go downstairs dressed and ready with loving arms to welcome my father back mm. uh, on a, a trip that he had spent literally 60 hours in the air. Mm. It was started because Prime Minister Holt of Australia had uh, disappeared in a swimming accident. And my father felt great kinship to him personally and to the Australian people who had welcomed him into their homes uh, during World War II. And so he decided he really yearned to be with them as they unexpectedly lost mm. their president and to tell them that their president and their people mattered to this president and our people. So he went there, but if he went to Australia, how could he go to Australia mm. and not go to Vietnam? Mm. And so, of course, he went to, to see uh, our soldiers and sailors and airmen and all who were serving in Vietnam and to tell them that their president cared and their president uh, was grateful to them. And he also went, I think, to Pakistan, mm. which is uh, uh, quite moving considering today's circumstances. Uh, he had a great respect for Ayub Khan, who was poignantly focused on trying to help his uh, third world country come into the, the world of nations uh, with more opportunity for all of his people. And he had programs that were very much like the great societies uh, in terms of housing and education and those sorts of things. And my father uh, felt uh, great um, appreciation and wanted to let him know that uh, he honored that. Mm -hmm. uh, how penetrating that is today when we think about all the things that have changed in our relationships. Uh, and then, of course, my father was first and foremost the most ecumenical man I ever knew <laughs> and I think I ever will know. He went to, he started off church at his own church at 9 o'clock in the morning, and then he went to 11 o'clock service with mother, and then he went to 1 o'clock service with me. And I kept telling him, Daddy, you don't need to go with me. Uh, uh, you've already been twice. And he said to me, Lucy, you think it's about... Uh, uh, the fact that I'm trying to be a loving daddy, especially when my husband was in Vietnam the next year. Mm. And uh, uh, he said, it's not that. It's when you're in my position, you need all the help you can get. <laughs> and, and so he decided he needed all the help he could get. And how could he end this trip during the holy season of Christmas and not go by Italy mm. and see the Pope mm. and see by visiting together somehow some way they could create peace on earth, goodwill to men, really not be just an aspiration, but a fact. Mm -hmm. So he came home and he landed at Andrews Air Force Base at 3.30 in the morning, or 3.45, and then he helicoptered to the South Lawn. And we marched down like little... Um, um, <laughs> Oh, uh, soldiers, ourselves, to the front door. Little nutcrackers would be more appropriate <laughs> this time of year. Uh, to the front door to uh, greet him with open arms and say, welcome back, Daddy. We're so glad to have you. Mm. Thinking, misguidedly, mm. that he would want to go to bed and fall asleep and stay there for uh, several days, because he'd done this all in less than a week, four and a half days. Uh, that was not the case with Lyndon Johnson. 
nobody loved Christmas more than Lyndon Johnson. And he was into the idea of giving. And he had to have an outfit for every woman on his staff. <laughs> and I, I'm looking out, and I'm seeing one who might have been a recipient of one of those <laughs> outfits. Uh, and uh, he had to have a present for present for every man on his staff. And he wanted to make sure that uh, uh, everyone that had befriended him felt his friendship that year. Mm. And then, of course. Uh, while he wanted all of those things, it took an awful lot of elves to make it happen. So uh, members of the staff who were already feeling reasonably burdened, uh, and especially those 200 of them that had gone around the, the, the world with him in this uh, lightning uh, speed uh, tour of the universe, um, got busy being Santa's elves. And he didn't stop for a minute mm. until Christmas was over mm. because he wanted to celebrate the hope that he was feeling after that phenomenal trip mm. with everybody he loved. And, and one of the people who accompanied your father on that trip is sitting in the audience, Larry Temple, with a special mm. counsel to the president when he took that four and a half day trip around the world. Absolutely. And Larry serves as president of our foundation very ably and very lovingly, although he does try to remind us sometimes that he still has a uh, full-time day job. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we understand that. We recognize that, appreciate that. And so we know in true Lyndon Johnson family, he's working more than one full-time job. There you go. That's and, at Christmas, we want to acknowledge that and say thank you very much and thank you to his beloved bride for having put up with it all these many years. Also has a December 26th birthday, so uh, Merry Christmas, Happy Birthday, to <laughs> quote Lucy Johnson. So, so, so you, 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 un you understand that feeling Mother had. Uh, Stuart, uh, talk about Dr. Biden and what she thought about when she put together the White House this Christmas. Well, it was the gifts from the heart theme that she came up with, and it was depicting the various gifts that are important to all of us, as I mentioned, family, community, faith. Uh, even she gets into the performing arts, into nature, uh, the, and um, it's beautifully depicted in through, throughout the rooms of the house. It's funny how the press, though, uh, will criticize the Trump decorations, and then they'll turn around and criticize the Biden decorations because they were different than the Trump decorations. But <laughs> every first lady does what inspires them and what they want to share with the American people. The thing that I like about what Mrs. Biden did this year is the, the decorations are elegant, sophisticated, but it allows the house to show through, mm. the White House itself. And that, I think, is very important, that you don't clutter or cover the significance of that people's house, but that you highlight it and bring it to life. And so I think her theme uh, and the way that it's been decorated is really, really beautiful. And, and those gifts are what a first family uh, tries to do That's right. in whatever time they're allotted. It, it, it is the spirit of Christmas, yes, but it's, it's the spirit of uh, the presidency as And well. the gifts of the family is in the state dining room. There are two trees flanking the Lincoln portrait above the mantle, and they're covered in photographs of all presidential families, including the Johnson mm. family. And so mm. it's really beautiful. They've, she's done a real, I think a very good job of trying to depict presidencies and families throughout the course of our nation's history, mm. not focus on the present family. So, uh, so she, Jill Biden was the second lady for eight years. She's been first lady for just under a year. How does she look at the role of first lady? Well, I think, um, you know, it does prepare you somewhat, but until you come into that particular role and you're looked at by the entire country, mm. you have expectations placed on you uh, to be the first lady of the United States. You're not given a salary. There is no job description that you have to perform. Mm. And yet, having worked collaboratively and closely with Mrs. Obama, she had ideas and issues that she wanted to continue. And one thing that I think is very impressive is that she has continued teaching. She's a community college teacher, and she teaches 
Uh, we try to schedule things or do things with the White House, and the days are blocked off because she's teaching mm. those days, and she has that commitment. So the first first lady in modern times that has had a job outside of the job of being first lady, which is a full-time job. So that is somewhat unique. But I think their family is also very important and bringing them together. And I was um, in the West Wing one day uh, presenting something to the president and in bounces a bunch of grandchildren, you know, just in and out. And it's really, it's wonderful. You get the sense that it's a home to them. It's, mm. here's this one small box of a president's house and it's the office to the president and his staff. It's the home to the president and his family. It's the ceremonial stage, if you will, upon which our nation receives its most important guests. And it's also a museum during which normal times, half a million or so people a year get to go through. And if you can imagine all of that happening at your house, that's a lot of activity. Uh, but I think she balances it really, really well And having been spouse to the vice president for those years. She sort of trained and observed uh, I think it, it helped her as well, so she knew what she wanted to do a little bit better when she came into office or come in, came into being First Lady. Mark, I, I'd like to follow up on the question you asked oh, me earlier, uh, because uh, I understand that this uh, evening is being uh, recorded for uh, friends of the LBJ Library uh, outside of this wonderful room to see at the uh, time of their own choosing. And I, I'd like to uh, make an additional comment. Uh, December 9th, 1967, my mother's words about my sister were all true. Mm. She was an exquisite bride mm. who had chosen a long red velvet dress that was high style and looked marvelous on her. And it celebrated Christmas just, just the way uh, she was dressed. And um, uh, so I, I said red, did I? Oh, shame on me. It's white, uh, obviously, for the bride. Uh, but, but, but everything else was in red. Uh, uh, our bridesmaids' dresses were in red. And it, it, it was an elegant, beautiful evening. Uh, my mother was so proud of her. But she was also aware that my father could be tempted to do some things that might oh, no. upstage the bride. <laughs> <laughs> Cannot imagine this. And my, and my mother and I were determined, if it were possible, <laughs> to see that avoided. <laughs> it was not. Lyndon Johnson waited until, I, I confess, I'm very grateful he waited till the last minute uh, after the bride and groom uh, had cut their cake and, and had their major celebration mm -hmm. to go get his grandchild uh, to come to the wedding. And of course, the grandchild was 18 months old and, uh, and um, probably was bent a little bit towards uh, upstage. And, and then he went and got his dog uh, that was uh, oh, no. dressed in a sequin coat that said, <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> so, so my father, as I said, he loved Christmas. <laughs> and he wanted to celebrate with everybody, from the babies to the dogs, even at my <laughs> sister's wedding. Uh, and my sister was... Uh, blessedly, a wonderful sport about it all. I'm reminded when you talked about your father, your, your fear of your father upstaging Linda, your sister, of a <laughs> quote about Teddy Roosevelt, whose daughter said of him, he wanted to be the, the bride at every wedding, the corpse at every funeral, and the <laughs> baby at every christening. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, when, and, and when asked uh, about controlling Alice, he said, I can either be president of the United States or I can control That's Alice. Right. I can't do That's both right. at the same time. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Stuart, uh, you had not had the vantage point on the White House that you have now before you took the job. Mm -hmm. What most surprised you about the White House operation after you began observing it in your current post? Well, I think we've already touched on that, and that is we perceive it to be this influx and outflow of political personalities mm -hmm. that come in. 
and the White House gets reduced to who's standing behind a podium with says the White House behind them, or maybe a speech from the Oval Office. But it's a very large apparatus of activity and events that keep in motion the life of the president and the, the activity of the White House. And so I was really pleased to meet and get to know all of these people that work behind the scenes, sort of the Wizard of Oz effect of behind the walls of the White House. And that was surprising uh, to me because I was not completely familiar with that, uh, but it's inspirational as well. So that was probably the most significant thing uh, for me. And then, as also alluded to, the smooth transition between, for us, going from working with Mrs. Obama and her team to Mrs. Trump and her team and Dr. Biden and her team. Uh, I would not have thought there would have been that as smooth as it's been for us, but it, it has been. But if I could just step in, as, other, as you have gone to go back to a Harkin thing, uh, we've mentioned Linda several times, and she is a wonderful friend to us as well and has done many uh, projects for us. But that wedding in the East Room uh, 54 years ago this December was the last wedding that was held in the East Room mm. of the White House, so a significant piece of history. And, of course, it was Christmas time, which added a whole different festive mood to it, and it was also... Christmas of 1967, that the watercolor uh, that is depicted on this ornament, this Robert Lester watercolor that your mother had commissioned of the Christmas tree in the Blue Room, was done that Christmas, and it became the feature of this year's ornament. So Christmas of 67 was significant for this and for the wedding. And everything about life in the White House is complex. Mm. <laughs> and so was that wedding, as many weddings across the country were. It was a day of great celebration of a beautiful bride and an elegant groom who was a member of the White House social mm -hmm. staff mm -hmm. uh, and uh, from the Marine Corps and an escort there for the ladies who came singly to White House events. He, they would dress uh, uh, they would dance with them. They would present the names of the people mm -hmm. who were coming through a receiving line. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, my sister came through a receiving line one day, and I think the eyes met, and that was the end of that. <laughs> uh, 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 but this really remarkable patriot was not only getting married, but he'd gotten orders to go to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And so there was that, pa that pallor over mm -hmm. that marvelous once in a lifetime. And they've been married over 50 years, so it really mm -hmm. has been once of a lifetime mm -hmm. event. Was uh, covered some degree with the recognition that uh, it was not long before mm -hmm. he would leave uh, for Vietnam. Uh, something that a lot of people in the military had kind of hoped that might not happen because mm -hmm. of how it might be difficult to have a president's son in, 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 a, in a war theater, but something Chuck, as a very patriotic Marine, wanted very mm -hmm. much to do. So uh, when it came time for them to leave the East Room, they marched out under a, some swords yeah. uh, by his fellow mm -hmm. Marines. Uh, uh, and uh, then they took Chuck's sword and cut the wedding cake. <laughs> <laughs> and so it, it, it really was uh, uh, such a sentimental journey, uh, filled with the best of times and also recognizing some of the most painful of mm -hmm. times. And I think that Christmas is like that for mm -hmm. lots of us. Mm -hmm. When we look around and we see that uh, somebody we love isn't at the table who was once there, when we see some little person who is there who, who, who we never knew might be, uh, it's a, a season of, of mixed emotions. Mm -hmm. And so was that a day of mixed emotions for all of us, for Linda and Chuck who began their life in the White House and have spent that life in public service ever since. As, as Lucy suggests, the, the bride, Linda Johnson, and the groom, Chuck Robb, have been married 54 years this month, mm -hmm. which is a remarkable thing. So I want to, talk, I want to uh, ask you the same question I asked Stuart. Uh, you came into the White House under far different circumstances than, 
and Stuart uh, beginning his job. Uh, but you had been the daughter of the vice president. In those days, there was no official white, uh, uh, residence for the vice president. We now have the Naval Observatory in Washington where the, the second family lives. But that didn't exist for your family. You lived in a private home. But you moved into the White House, as we discussed on December 7th. What was your biggest surprise? What was the biggest revelation about the White House when you became a resident of that mansion? Well, uh, let me step back a moment, if I might. Uh, I'm walking up the stairs of our private residence uh, uh, during the vice presidency after the assassination. And I hear my parents' voice, voices raised. Mm -hmm. And frankly, I never heard my parents' voices raised towards mm. each other. And so I did what no daughter ought to ever do, but uh, I was tempted to walk towards the door and kind of put my ear to it to hear what this was all about. And my father was saying, Bird, we have to. And my mother was saying, any day, any day, but move into the White House on December 7th. And my father said, it's a day that's convenient for Mrs. Kennedy and for the Secret Service, and it's not about us. It's about them, and it's about the nation, and it's what we have to do. And I was a young 16-year-old who hadn't taken American history yet and who didn't appreciate fully that uh, December 7th was the day that uh, America had gone to mm -hmm. war after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. So for my mother's generation, it was exceedingly painful mm -hmm. to launch something that was so important mm -hmm. as my father's presidency on that day. And so she, for the first time in my memory, and, and the last time, uh, was raised her voice in plaintive uh, request any day but that day. Mm. But when my father said, it's about the nation, it's not about us, she mm. said, of course, of course. And so we moved into the White House during that Christmas season. Uh, uh, and to, as I alluded earlier, the very painful uh, presence of, of black draping everywhere. And the first two weeks were all about uh, mourning. And my first two weeks living in the White House uh, were all about mourning. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we had that first Christmas and we were delayed leaving to go to the ranch, my father was desperate to go to the LBJ ranch because the LBJ ranch, the hill country of Texas, uh, my father always said was the, was the place where people knew when you were sick and they cared when you died. And he had been through so much and he wanted that mm. comfort of home that comfort of home and I think that we all yearn for during the holidays. And so my mother wanted it for him. But the Congress was in session. <laughs> and there was much to be decided. And Major Bill to take place with foreign aid. Mm. The more things change, <laughs> yeah. the more they stay the same. And so my father wasn't about to leave. He'd been Senate Majority Leader before, and he felt he knew better than to leave town when there was still work to be done, no matter how desperate he was to come home for the holidays. But on December 24th, uh, the rest of the Congress decided that they were desperate to go home for the holidays too, and they found some way to come and reason together and pass that legislation mm. and be able to go home. And so we didn't spend that, that um, Christmas Eve at the White House. We spent it on Air Force One, going home <laughs> to the people who knew us best and loved us anyway. <laughs> and it was a, a, a great time of celebration. But what I discovered, I guess, was that um, 
for me, the beginning days in the White House were full of excitement, new things. I had a, I had a fireplace in my room, and it was Christmas season. Uh, wow, how, how fancy, how, how mm -hmm. exciting, how storybook that was. And then I found that everything I said and everything I did was not only subject to observation of the American people, but could somehow bring either joy to my parents and pride mm. or public pain to them as well. Mm. So I realized that um, not only is a first lady someone who has an unpaid job, but every member of a first family mm. Mm. really does. Mm. And while my father was very much in favor of child labor laws. <laughs> he had never intended to think that that uh, uh, involved his children. <laughs> and so Linda and I, from the uh, time we were able to carry a coat of a constituent, we were there when people entered the door and went and put them up. And we had always been a little bit like the farm families, where everybody has a job, somebody tills a field, and somebody uh, um, uh, gathers in the chickens, and somebody gathers in the eggs, and somebody um, takes care of the farm animals. Everybody has a job. Well, that's kind of the way my parents looked at those next five years for Linda and me. We always had a job, but we knew whatever that job, how much it may have impeded upon our adolescent social life, <laughs> there were more jobs that were more important to do. And so during those next five years, I covered 26 states by myself uh, campaigning because my father made me feel like I was so important to his presidency that uh, if I didn't go and I didn't thank all of these people for our family, um, he, he, he was depending upon me. He was counting on me. I felt I was important. And of course, I think from his perspective, he knew it was better to have me think I was an important part of the family <laughs> than I was on the outside and, and full of resentment. So he knew how to appeal to, to my vanity. So. Uh, those first few days in, in, in the White House was an introduction to the course that was to come. But uh, my mother uh, uh, said it best. And I know I've shared this with you. I'm not sure I've shared it with all of you, so forgive me if this memory of a nearly 75-year-old uh, is repetitive. But every day, in the White House was going to be a gift, but never more so mm. than at Christmas. Mm. Mm. Speaking of Christmas, Stuart, the, the, White, the enormously successful White House ornament program mm -hmm. was established 20 years after the White House Historical Association was established by Jacqueline Kennedy. Talk about the origins of the White House uh, ornament program. Well, this uh, little ornament here began in 1981, in Christmas of 1981. Nancy Reagan was first lady, the first Christmas of the Reagan presidency. And I often joke that if I had been in the room when a group of staff went in and talked with her and had the idea of an ornament, I would have thought, sure, fine, do a Christmas ornament. But thank goodness they did, because this took off and has been the bread and butter financially for our organization for decades. Uh, we now have broadened that to traditional philanthropy, and that's doing very well. But this became um, very, very, very popular really quickly. And I'm sure many of, all of you have seen it. Many of you probably collected them. But when she made that decision, one, a good thing for me is the decision was made to feature a different president each year sequentially. So I don't have to think about, okay, what president are we going to feature this year and get in trouble that way. So we started <laughs> with George Washington. And we have now rolled up to Lyndon Johnson. Mm -hmm. And we've paused a few years along the way to commemorate a significant White House anniversary like the 200th anniversary of the White House in the year 2000. Mm -hmm. But these, for the past 41 years now, have been made, or 41 Christmases, have been made by a veteran-founded small business in Rhode Island. They're all American-made. Each one depicts the presidency in some way. As I mentioned, there's that Robert Lessig watercolor of uh, the Blue Room Christmas tree. 
On the reverse are the uh, Texas blue bonnets that uh, Mrs. Johnson loved so. The beautiful quote by President Johnson, our mission is at once the oldest and the most basic of this country, to right wrong, to do justice, to serve man. And this little tool is not just something beautiful, it's not just something that helps fund our organization, but it teaches a story of White House history. Mm. Each one uh, every year comes with a booklet that tells the story of that entire presidency, and you'll that family on the front will look very familiar to you there. Well, it does, but I'd, I'd like to make a comment about it. There's no way any of you all out there in the audience can see that, but if you buy one, you will. <laughs> uh, 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 you will see that uh, my sister is smiling for the camera as she should, and I respect and appreciate that. But I'm looking a little melancholy. And I think that uh, that was a combination of two sisters' response. Linda is living up to the day and handling it with grace. And I am succumbing a little bit to the <laughs> fact that my husband is in Vietnam. Wow. Both of our husbands, of course, wow. were in Vietnam. So it was an unusual Christmas uh, for this family because uh, our husbands were the last um, to sons-in-law of a president mm. to serve in a, a war theater. Mm. Uh, and uh, we are showing some of that. You'll see that my son is sitting on my lap with his daddy half a world away, that my sister's brand new daughter is sitting in her arms mm. with her husband half a world away. And my father has a dog and a Merry Christmas out there. <laughs> so so it, it, it sort of sort of tells a great story of a family. It does. Because um, so many Christmases since, there have been uh, families like ours whose uh, husbands and wives and sons and daughters have been away at Christmas serving our country. Mm. Now, President Biden has brought our men and women home from Afghanistan. But around the world, there are American patriots in our military mm -hmm. and uh, in our, our diplomatic corps who will be away from their loved ones at Christmas and feeling that sense of, of absence and loss. And mm. this was just one of those many, many families who's felt it once and understood and understands what that is like. Mm. You mentioned the presidential grandchildren and pointed them out in this picture. And I think you may know this story, but I think it's very powerful and poignant that your grandmother in January of 1969, just before leaving office, had the idea to create a children's garden, which is tucked away down by the tennis court, not in public view. And since the Johnson presidency, the presidential grandchildren, not children, but grandchildren, have all put their hands or footprints mm. into the cement there in that beautiful garden. So the follow-up on that is, you have just made my year because you said my grandmother. Oh, and I'm obviously sorry. Obviously, <laughs> it was my mother. I'll take it, Stuart. I'll take it. It's an run, understandable and run, mistake, Stuart. And, <laughs> and, 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 and run with the compliment. Thank uh, you for correcting uh, me. And, <laughs> and, and uh, we went down to dedicate <laughs> this wonderful yes. garden. And uh, my son, who was 18 months yes. old and busy, and I may have taken my eye off of him for just a moment. <laughs> and he ended up in the pond. <laughs> and, and so uh, a wonderful uh, member of that White House extended family, right. my mother's social secretary, Bess Abel, had joined us. And in a moment, mm. she takes off her coat, gives it to me, and I wrap my son in her coat and whiz off from the rest of the <laughs> dedication to take him up to the house to make sure that he doesn't catch cold 
uh, for the last <laughs> days that we have in the White House. Uh, but that, I think, is kind of the, the spirit of those who, who serve in the White House. They literally take off their coats mm. for the first family and, and the coats off their back to try to be of service to their country. And uh, uh, Bess has a great uh, book coming out in, in, in January telling mm. that story. Mm. So uh, I'd like to uh, take the opportunity to say uh, once more to her family, mm. thank you for the service and that she And she just recently passed. She yes, was a she wonderful just, lady. And yeah. I had, my sister and I both had the privilege mm -hmm. of, of speaking at the memorial mm -hmm. uh, for her. Uh, uh, for her. But mm -hmm. uh, not only did uh, she serve, but of mm -hmm. course her, uh, she served as my mother's social secretary and uh, her husband Tyler right. ser served as our chief of protocol. Yes. So they were a, 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 a really a dynamic. Quite a Washington power couple. Well, quite, a, <laughs> quite, quite a wonderful couple. And uh, uh, we uh, uh, spent many precious moments with them and among right. them that dedication of that garden. Right. Well, that's an example of your mother doing something that was um, unique to that presidency, but has lingered and lasted and become part of every presidency since. And that was a gift from, from my mother right. to the White House. She wanted to have one parting gift to the White House. My mother had a degree from the University of Texas, where mm -hmm. we uh, are now a part of here at the LBJ mm -hmm. Library uh, uh, in history. And she had a degree in journalism. And do you know and she boy, also were those two degrees useful to her in serving. And where else Johnson. did she go to college? Oh, she went to school in in, in uh, what was essentially first year in a sort of a finishing school. Well, no, no, no. Well, you, know, you may say that, but I, I, you have an interest in this. Answer. <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, my alma mater is the University of Alabama, and your mother went to school for a summer at the University oh, of for Alabama. for a summer in Alabama. Yes, that's yes. right. So, so we, roll we claim her. We and claim her. That's no, right. I was, I, was, I was thinking about her first. <laughs> that's right. Some people call Alabama a finishing school, too. That's <laughs> well, it's no, no, no. No, no, no. I was, I was not referring. This, 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 school has, uh, this school has gone out of business yes. uh, decades ago. Right. Well, we're very proud of that connection. Well, I want to quote Sing. Lucy's father, who said on Christmas Eve in 1967, when you think of the bravery of the human spirit, and the compassion of the human heart, and the power of life to triumph over pain and darkness, you are properly thankful. Your own spirits are lifted higher, and you say it, and you mean it, as I do now. Merry Christmas mm -hmm. and happy holidays. I want to mm -hmm. thank Stuart McLaurin and our own Lucy Johnson for a delightful evening, and I want to wish you all a Merry Christmas and happy holidays. Thank Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. And come back in January, please. And get an ornament, or 20, or And 100. get an ornament. Uh, <laughs> Thank you all very much. We hope much. you will join us in having on your tree another one of these marvelous <laughs> White House Historical Association trees. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. What a delight.